Time now for Morning Rounds with CBS News contributors Dr. Holly Phillips and Dr. Tara Narula. We begin with two new studies that support controversial guidelines for wider use of cholesterol-lowering drugs known as statins. Holly, what did these studies find? Well, so back in 2013, the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology jointly released new guidelines for who should be on statins. So as you said, statins are cholesterol-lowering drugs. They're things that we know by the names of uh, Crestor, Lipitor, Zocor. Uh, and the new guidelines basically included many more people. Uh, in total, uh, they suggested that about 56 million Americans should actually be on statins. Wow. Uh, and that's roughly 50% of the population between the ages of 40 and 75. But what these new studies showed is that those guidelines actually are correct. Um, ultimately, they correctly identified who was at a high risk of having a heart attack. And also, the treating heart disease earlier with statins proved to be cost effective. So even though more people required medication, these studies suggest that that's going to be cost effective overall. In 2013, when they were announced, they were pretty controversial. Exactly. Is that continuing? Do people still find them? I think that people are starting to get used to them in some respect, but they certainly generate a lot of controversy for a couple of reasons. One is that they really shifted the focus away from LDL or cholesterol numbers and from targets in terms of trying to treat to a goal LDL number and shifted towards focusing on risk. So, Vanita, what is your 10-year risk of having a heart attack and stroke and treating you according to your risk category? So there was some controversy about that switch, but the biggest controversy came in terms of patients who were relatively healthy, patients who were ages 40 to 79 with an LDL that was about 70 to 189 and those patients who had a calculated 10-year risk score of seven and a half percent or higher were recommended to be put on a statin. So that concern was that are we potentially over treating a lot of patients by lowering that threshold to seven and a half percent and also the calculator that was included in these guidelines to get that seven and a half percent risk there was questions about if that might be overestimating risk. So Tara, what are, we, what are doctors and patients now supposed to do with these guidelines? Right, so they're guidelines. That's the big thing. Yeah. They are a roadmap. They are the opening of a discussion. And mm -hmm. I think that's the big thing to remember, that no patient is the same. Everybody has a different story, has different preferences. And so really it needs to be an individualized discussion between doctor and patient about what their risk is and what they want to do. And so, for instance, there may be a patient who has a 7.5% risk, but they have a very strong family history, and they might want to be more aggressive. And so then maybe it makes more sense. And somebody else who has a seven and a half percent risk and says well I just want to try diet and lifestyle first let me try that first and so you really have to be flexible in terms of working with your patients well soccer fever continues to spread in the United States after Team USA's World Cup victory but as more teens participate a new study raises concerns over the impact of player collisions. So what are the risks if you're if they're colliding? Well, it is interesting. You know, we don't tend to think of soccer as a dangerous sport for kids, uh, but actually it causes more concussions than any other sport except for football. Uh, so what the study did, it, they looked, it was a large study. They looked at about 2 million high school practices and games uh, and calculated how many people actually suffered concussions. One of the things they found was that heading the ball, basically hitting the ball with your head, resulted in more concussions than any other play that would be passing the ball or defending the ball um, but most striking from the study is that it wasn't the act of hitting the ball with your head that caused concussions it was more player to player contact so if two players are going up to head the ball they might hit each, each other, other. It, with their heads or you might take an elbow to your head and that's what was really resulting in the injuries some players uh, Tara including Brandy Chastain the former women's soccer star have, have proposed banning heading for kids under the age of 14 is that the answer do you think you know I think it's not as simple as that mm -hmm. uh, no parent wants to sit on the sidelines you know clenching their teeth worrying yeah. and especially at ages that are younger than 14 where the brain is still developing and neck strength is still developing those kids are particularly vulnerable and we don't really know is heading safe for any age range right. um, but I think what Holly pointed out is really true is that you know while heading the ball was technically associated with about 30 percent of concussions it really wasn't the ball and head contact it was the athlete athlete contact yeah. And so, you know, the authors make the point that what we really should be doing is teaching our young athletes about sportsmanship, about better technique, telling our referees to really call fouls and, you know, be aggressive about enforcing rules and that changing the nature of the game so there's less of that, you know, body head contact is really what might be more important than just saying let's ban heading completely. 
All right, you can fool some people with a fake smile, but not your smartphone. Researchers at Northwestern University uncovered a link between the amount of time spent on a smartphone and depression. The study also finds GPS tracking helped identify people with depressive symptoms with 87% accuracy. I absolutely <laughs> love this. I love the idea that you can diagnose people with depression uh, without even asking them any questions. You know, so one of the things the study found was that people who were depressed uh, spent an average of 68 minutes on their uh, smartphones, whereas people who were not spent 17 minutes. But interestingly, through the GPS uh, tracking, you could find that people who were depressed were more likely to stay at home uh -huh. and also had more irregular schedules, uh, which does go along with the sort of low motivation and the isolation that depressed people feel. So I'm not surprised it's a really accurate kind of diagnostic tool. Depression is such a difficult disorder, too, because lots of times patients don't want to talk about their symptoms, they yeah. don't want to be open about it, or they may not even recognize that they've changed their patterns of behavior. So to be able to use technology in this way to identify these behavioral changes is really an interesting and novel idea. I'm most nervous because I feel like you and I, we're on our phone more than 68 <laughs> I was, I was going to say, yeah. I want to meet the person who's only on their phone 17 minutes. I know. <laughs> I want to sit next to him. Yeah. All right, well, finally, sleeping on the job may not be such a bad thing after all. Researchers at the University of Michigan found a quick nap at work might help ease frustrations and calm some of those impulsive behaviors. They say a little shut eye on the clock could be an easy, cost effective way to help improve workplace safety. <laughs> I think we all should do is follow the Spaniards and take a siesta. I like you know, really. Take a lesson from that, our toddlers. That's what we should do. Yeah, <laughs> put our phones away too. Yeah. <laughs> all good advice. A massage in the office would be nice too. Anyway, Dr. Holly <laughs> Phillips, Dr. Tara Narula, thank you both for being here this morning.